going to jump right into our first um, speaker today. Carly is an environmental specialist with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Agency, Gosh, I work there too, and I don't know how to say it. Um, and she's going to give us a little bit of background on uh, green infrastructure and talk about the uh, PCA stormwater manual as well. So Carly, I see your screen. Um, right. Feel free to get started. All right, sounds good. So yeah, as Kristen said, I'm Carly Chaldal. I work um, at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I specifically work in the stormwater section. Um, I'm a project manager for some green infrastructure work that we have going on um, in the stormwater manual, but I also, my main focus is working with the MS4 permit, and right now I'm in the process of issuing permit coverage. So that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, but just to kind of start off today, um, if my slides will change, maybe. There we go. Um, I just kind of wanted to start with this kind of continuum, right? We're talking about green infrastructure, kind of moving away from that more traditional, like gray infrastructure, you know, getting that raindrop away from its origin as quick as possible. But now we're starting to see the value in keeping that raindrop where it falls, whether that's through filtration, infiltration, rain gardens, or maybe it's a pond or something of that sort. You know, so we're keeping that raindrop where it falls and some of the local practices um, that I'm sure we'll hear about today in later presentations, right, are from rain gardens or bioretention, bio um, permeable pavements, green roofs, trees and tree trench, tree trench boxes, um, rainwater har and ra rainwater harvesting. And this image here kind of just kind of throws all of them together kind of in a parking lot setting, right? We have our tree trenches, we have our previous pavement, we also have our bioretention, our rain gardens right here in the middle. And then you can kind of see the cross section of the under drains um, underneath those practices. Um, so as Kristen kind of mentioned, I was going to talk about stormwater manual and some updates that we actually have specifically to green infrastructure work in the manual. So prior to my time at the agency, um, there was just staff kind of working on this when they had time um, and I expressed interest and we kind of saw that there was a need for this um, particular material. So in 2020, this work kind of kicked off and we're working with a consultant, um, Lumna Tech, and in that we formed a stakeholder group and there's actually a couple people on the call that are part of that group. So thank you for being on that. Um, but they've been super helpful in helping identify areas of green infrastructure that um, need to be kind of prioritized and put into the manual, maybe rearranged or reorganized, restructure the pages. So it makes sense for um, practitioners like yourself when you're going in there, you're finding what you need. Um, so that was kind of the first step of the work is identifying those priority areas. Um, right now, Lumna Tech has been working on um, updating and organizing the operation and maintenance, our O&M pages specific to um, the different green infrastructure practices. Sorry, it sounds like we have somebody who's unmuted. See if I can just wait for a second. Find them. If you can, go ahead and mute yourselves. Looks like most of you are. Okay, it sounds great. I just wanted to stop there for a second so no one uh, gets confused with what I'm saying. But anyway, so yeah, right now we're in the process. Um, Lumina Tech is in the process of updating the operation and maintenance um, pages specifically for each green, green infrastructure practice. And I will go through um, where we can find those in the manual in a little bit here. But um, the plan is if we continue to get um, funding for this work, um, the plan is to continue working down the list of priorities that were created and working with the stakeholders older team um, to kind of work through this and create materials that will be beneficial for practitioners in the field. Um, so now I'm going to stop my PowerPoint. I'm going to start sharing um, the stormwater manual. So hopefully you guys can all see um, the stormwater manual. I'm sure some of you have or have access it at some point um, if you're working in the stormwater world, but it's definitely um, got a lot of resources, it's got checklists, it's got case studies, it's got design things, it has all types of things. But I'm mostly going to be talking about the green stormwater infrastructure and sustainable um, stormwater management page that we've created um, in response to this green infrastructure work. So if we click on that, it'll bring us to this page. 
um, and we are in the process of, you know, building up this information. So some of these links might not have information yet, but we're working on it. And one of the goals in the next one to two years to get this, get these um, populated. Um, so we just kind of have a general introduction of what um, a green infrastructure is. If you're interested in looking at a specific practice, click on rain gardens first. Um, it'll bring you to this page, give you a general overview, and that it has all these different sections. You know, maybe you're looking for a design criteria for bioretention. Um, you can click on that, and it'll bring you to some of the design considerations to take in when you're um, planning. Um, let's see. We go back to the main page. You know, maybe you curious about perivial pavements, kind of a similar concept. Um, you have these different things, design, construction, assessing those right there. If I go back to the main page. Um, this operation and maintenance of green infrastructure, um, best management practices, that's the work that's being done right now with Lumnatech. So if I click on that, it's going to bring us to um, the page. There's a nice chart here, and then um, it has each one of the green infrastructure practices broken down. Keep in mind, this isn't quite done yet. We're hoping to have everything uploaded by the end of this week. Um, so hopefully that will be there. But anyway, so if you want to learn about bioretention, the first um, link here under that category is basically kind of a general overview of um, bioretention and OM issues, design, construction. We got post-construction, um, nice tables in here kind of laying out maybe some maintenance that's needed over the lifetime of the practice. There's um, some a plans and checklists in here that might be um, helpful to you. Um, if I go back to that main operation of each of the practices, the second page is going to be the supplemental information. So if I open that, it's going to be um, kind of more specific like to that practice. And if there's like anything you're kind of want to specifically know, maybe it's snow storage, maybe it's heavy metals or whatever, whatever you're kind of, that's going to be um, more specific to that practice. Um, that's how all these are each set up. So if you want to look at tree trenches, it's going to be kind of that general information. If you want to know more, that's going to be like the supplemental information. Um, these two down here that are red, those are working on being uploaded. And then if you're curious where um, information was gathered, there's a resource catalog right here. So you can feel free to download that and take a look at that at the resources Lumnatech used. Um, if I go back to the main um, green infrastructure page, we scroll down. We do have some case studies in here um, that are green infrastructure related that were worked on in the last um, work order. So if you are interested, these are different projects is projects um, in Minnesota. So feel free to look at them and they have all the information. Um, about the project. So that's kind of a, a neat thing. Um, I think that probably sums it up for what I wanted to talk about on the manual page, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, I know this is about green infrastructure, so I'm hoping if the, any of those tools on there would be helpful if you're, you know, needing more information. Um, these are the links, the hyperlinks to all the pages I just talked about. Um, I can send these to Kristen and she can send them out to the group um, if anybody's interested in on where to find this stuff. And then, you know, if you have any questions or you want to be on the tech team, you know, feel free, give me a call, send me an email. Maybe you have a project you think would be a good case study. You know, we're always looking for those. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. I guess if there's any questions or anything, I can take those now. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Um, I should mention that we are recording this workshop and then we will follow up with all of the slides and links to resources that are mentioned today. So um, you'll get an email hopefully later um, by the end of this week with all of that information. I am not seeing any questions popping up in the chat, but if anyone um, wants to raise their hand or feel free to unmute yourselves or add a question and then to, into the chat for Carly um, or anything about the stormwater manual or anything else, feel free to do so, or we can um, always circle back to Carly as well. 
Sean, I see I see your physical hand raised and you're muted. There we go. So the uh, so one of the issues we're working on with the Friends of Lake Hiawatha here uh, with um, the Minneapolis Park Board and Minneapolis Public Works is trying to deal with a huge pipe that kind of empties out into the lake unfiltered. And it'll be a number of years until the pipe can be turned into a more of a above ground filtration wetland thing. So in the meantime, they have to, we're trying to figure out if we can stick some kind of a big net thing on the end of the pipe that would capture trash <clears throat> before it cruises into the lake. And they attempted to do something in the past, but the trash would either kind of like flow over it or, or they're like worried that if there's a big rain event, <clears throat> the, the thing would get all clogged up and prevent water from flowing out. But I know in other states like California, they where they regulate trash under their whatever TMDLs, they have much better technologies and all that. So I don't know if anybody has any ideas about technologies and how you'd maintain them to capture trash before entering a water body. And Carly, maybe if you don't have an answer to that, maybe one of our other speakers can touch on that. Yeah, I can't say I know of other technologies. I mean, I've heard of the net things and I'm I've heard of um, that concern of all that trash going in um, to the lakes there, but I don't know of any um, technologies that could be used, unfortunately. Yeah, we could just try to network more with people on, you know, in states that have requirement to, you know, deal with trash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean, maybe we can follow up and uh, with some more information about that, your question later too, so. All right, now I'm not seeing other questions, so we can go ahead and move forward on our agenda. Uh, oh, I, okay, I see one. From Carol, Carly, I haven't read the manual. Does the manual provide a recipe for weed control for the various BMPs? Um, I think there is information on there about weed control. I'd have to find the specific page um, for you because the manual has a lot of pages. Um, but I can find that and get back to you um, probably later today or something. That works. Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, next, we're going to hear from James um, with Metro Blooms and Blue Thumb. Um, and so, James, I didn't ask you if you were going to share your screen and present slides. Otherwise, I can. I'm going to try. The last time I okay. tried to share my screen uh, through Teams, I had a little bit of trouble, but I, I believe in, I believe in me. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so I clicked share. Is it is anything being shared at this time? It is not. Okay, then I think I will uh, pass it over to you. Okay, let I'll me try go. one more time. Screen share, but uh, you have to pick the um, like the window you want to share, like your desktop or the application. I think. Yeah, yeah. I thought I did. I I clicked share screen. I went over to window. I selected PowerPoint. And I clicked share. But uh, but no yeah. dice. Yeah. Oh, geez. Teams is still working on some things. Uh, but I have them here, so I'll go ahead and pull them up, and you just tell me when to switch. Yep, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so um, my name is James Wolfen. I'm the Director of Education with uh, Metro <laughs> Blooms. And, uh, and uh, next slide, please. And I'm presenting on behalf of both Blue Thumb and my employer, Metro Blooms. So Metro Blooms is a nonprofit based out of Minneapolis. It's all about partnering with communities to, um, and I just realized that my camera's off. Sorry about that. That's all about partnering with communities to protect our water, uh, protect our pollinators. And a lot of uh, the, the medium we do that through is often through green infrastructure. 
Um, Metro Blooms helps to coordinate uh, the Blue Thumb Partnership. Uh, I've noticed that many of our members here today are Blue Thumb partners, uh, including uh, Stephanie Hatzenbuehler from Rochester, who actually is the acting uh, lead for uh, the Blue Thumb Partnership. And Blue Thumb is, has ve a very similar mission to Metro Blooms, where it's a private-public partnership that's all about um, trying to increase access for residents in achieving these kinds of different green infrastructure goals. So connecting residents with the different tools, resources, and local partners that can help them install green infrastructure to improve their local water quality, protect pollinators, and oftentimes that's through getting green plants and other green infrastructure, BMPs, or BMP stands for Best Management Practices in the ground. Uh, next slide, please. So something that we've recently developed is our Blue Thumb Sustainable Land Care Academy, where we worked with many of our partners like Hennepin County and uh, the Rice Creek Watershed District and quite frankly, countless others. Cap Region, who I know is here today as well. And uh, I saw Michaela New, who did our whole first, uh, first module, our Stormwater 101. But essentially we worked with our partners to kind of figure out five key elements of sustainable land care and figure out how we can provide a job skills training that focuses not only on providing these skills, but also highlighting career and academic pathways kind of in the green sector. So we do work with uh, professionals, but we also wanted to make this job skills training available to youth and young adults, uh, specifically youth and young adults from underserved communities to, cry, to try and increase diversity within the green sector. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sure that many of you know a lot of these facts about the green sector, the green infrastructure world on the whole. But um, green, the green sector on the whole is a very much a growing field, but underrepresented communities, specifically BIPOC community members, are severely underrepresented. Uh, next slide, please. So I did want to share a little factoid from um, a recent journal that I read, where despite increasing diversity in the United States, the racial composition in environmental institutions has remained low at 12 to 16 percent in what is described as a green ceiling. Um, and then it goes on to, to further highlight the lack of diversity in uh, green degree seeking programs. And this is something that Blue Thumb is really committed to changing. Uh, Metro Blooms and Blue Thumb, we already do so much work in our uh, environmental justice communities, but we want to go even further than that. We wanna make sure that the work that's being done in these communities, that those jobs are going to uh, the members of those communities. So it's even more than just putting green spaces in these areas. It's also trying to make sure that these turn into jobs and careers and academic opportunities for the individuals from those communities. Next slide, please. So now to actual uh, green infrastructure, and we, we think is this absolute dire need for land care and maintenance training programs. So across various municipalities throughout the Twin Cities, throughout the state of Minnesota, there are these enormous investments in green infrastructure where uh, our partners within Blue Thumb and other partners throughout the state are working with uh, engineering firms to install these incredible, massive green infrastructure, green infrastructure projects just like this one. So this is the Holland Basin. It's uh, right beside adjacent to Edison High School in Northeast Minneapolis, where the city partnered with um, Bar Engineering to install this massive, I think it's between four and 5,000 square foot uh, bioinfiltration uh, unit. Next slide, please. And this thing is meticulously planned. I tried to blow up the planting plan large enough where y'all could see it, but there's just so much depth to this and detail where it's even still difficult to see. But they break down at the planting zones with a great variety of different species from forbs to shrubs. The whole works, it was planned out meticulously. Uh, next slide, please. Even to the point of having the exact spacing of the plants shown in the planting plan for the installation uh, that took place. Next slide, please. However, far too often when we actually end up visiting these sites, this is what you end up seeing. So this is when we actually visited the Holland Basin. And it was a very unfortunate uh, situation that probably too many of us are uh, familiar with seeing that far too many of us have noticed, where there's this enormous investment made into green infrastructure, but when we fail to maintain it and we don't check on it periodically, it can just become overrun with weeds. This was more so a ragweed basin with some native plants interspersed more than it was a true rain garden full of native plants. And unfortunately, that can be the norm. 
where a common uh, a common theme we see when we partner with municipalities, when we partner with anyone who's done these green infrastructure installations, is that three to five years down the road, if there's not the the, the proper technical knowledge present, and there's not the um, and that same enthusiasm doesn't go into uh, maintaining the green infrastructure BNP that, that the institution just spent so much money on to install, it often gets overrun with weeds uh, and, and starts to fail to function. Uh, next slide, please. So I would, I would, I would, I'm kind of just going to roll through these. It's, I feel bad for Kristen because she has to try and uh, keep up with me, but um, yeah, so, and this is uh, at another site where it was the same situation. It was a rain garden that had been overtaken by purple loosestrife, cattails, and next slide, please. And, and other volunteer trees and even some shrubs that, you know, that weren't intended in the planting plan, but made their way in. Next slide, please. Uh, and this, and when you have weeds start to overtake a site, you get an overall loss in plant diversity, which isn't only bad for the functionality of the site, but it's also um, an issue for all of the wildlife, all of the pollinators, and all of the upper level trophic levels that um, you know would otherwise be using these sites as a source of habitat, forage, uh, nest laying, et cetera. So that loss in plant diversity has enormous ramifications on the ecosystem. Another issue for when a site goes unmaintained is you can start to see the area fail to function. So what we should be looking at here is the inlet to a rain garden. This at Theodore Worth Park. Michaela knew who I know who I know is with a, us today probably recognize this site because we just did our Blue Thumb uh, Sustainable land, land Care training with Michaela New and the uh, Mississippi Green Teamers uh, just around a month ago. And we got to see what can happen to an inlet, to an inlet, excuse me, when a site goes unmaintained. We have all sorts of weedy grasses and other weedy vegetation starting to overtake the, the, the inlet and that inhibits the ability of water to enter the BMP. That's why you can see that huge pileup of sediment and gunk just outside the rain garden when we want that to instead be captured by the rain garden and infiltrate within. Uh, next slide, please. So ultimately what we want to, to marry here is not only putting this enormous investment into the installation of green infrastructure, but marrying that to uh, also placing a similar investment in land care. Because without that similar investment in land care, you're going to see these incredible uh, green infrastructure projects start to fail over time. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to partner with community members, specifically local community members, where if we're doing a project in Northside Minneapolis, we want to train and work with local crews to kind of uh, make sure that there's that local investment in the community, in these green, green spaces that are being installed, while creating jobs, career opportunities, and academic opportunities for the youth that we're working with. Uh, next slide, please. So now what I want to do is I want to give you a quick run through the different elements we touch on in the Blue Thumb Sustainable Land Care Academy. <laughs> Next slide, please. Sorry, my cats are in the background making a gigantic ruckus. So the first module that I want to talk about is Stormwater 101. Next, next slide, please. So uh, now we'll go back to bar engineering, where um, these always start with figuring out the siting for green infrastructure planting. And whenever we're working with a group, we want to understand and we want to make sure that everyone on the staff or, that's or the apprentices going through the training understand how water moves through a site. If you want to have a successful uh, stormwater best management practice, you have to understand how the water is supposed to be directed, where the water is supposed to, to go, and um, where the water is supposed to infiltrate rather than shed off. So we want to make sure that everyone that we work with knows how to read a stormwater management plan and understand the different types of BMPs that they'll be working with. So the, the first module of that uh, Blue Thumb Sustainable Land Care program, it's all about understanding the importance of stormwater and how stormwater moves through a site and the different BMPs that exist for capturing and uh, you know, infiltrating stormwater. Next slide, please. After that, we give an introduction to rain gardens. We talk about all sorts of different BMPs, but we really want to single out rain gardens because we really view them as a, you know, kind of the gold medal of stormwater BMPs. Uh, this is a rain garden that was installed at um, Riverside Plaza, where we did exactly what we hoped to do. We worked with local community members, uh, leaders in the Riverside Plaza community to get these uh, rain gardens installed. And they have a combination of staff and volunteers that work to maintain these rain gardens and keep them in the, quite frankly, rather pristine shape that they're still into this day. 
Next slide, please. So with rain gardens, it goes even beyond understanding why they are important, but we also try to familiarize uh, everyone we work with with the different components of a rain garden, how they're built, the purposes of the different structures from an inlet to an outlet, understanding the purpose of the mulch. That way, when one of the apprentices visits a site with a rain garden, they know what they're supposed to be looking for. They know, they know that if the water isn't draining evenly throughout the site, that means there's probably a buildup of sediment somewhere. If water is struggling to enter in, they should be checking on the inlet. So it's a lot, it, we try to go even past just introducing them to what a rain garden is, but familiarizing the, the individuals with the different possible kind of uh, failures and the different components that goes into making a rain garden. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from there, we talk about native plants. Next slide. Sorry, Kristen, you have been keeping up brilliantly well, though. Uh, and here we have two goals. So first is just understanding the benefits of native plants. So I mentioned that we try to have a community-centric focus to this. So understanding that these can beautify your community, understanding that native plants uh, have root systems that extend deep into the ground and can capture stormwater, protecting local water quality, and also the impacts that this can have on pollinators and how that can relate to even things like local food production. Uh, what we also try to do is we really try to give a thorough introduction to basic plant morphology, covering things like leaf attachment, leaf arrangement, and root structure. If I had more times, I was going to try more time for this. I was going to try and include a video of uh, some of the youth we worked with at the Mississippi River Green Team, some of the youth that uh, that Michaela leads, where they did a really great job of um, kind of learning the basics of plant morphology and using that information to start to identify native plants in the field. Next slide, please. From there, we move on to uh, weedy and unwanted plants. Next slide, please. And here, this is probably the uh, the real meat of the program, where we start with, um, oh, I had something pop up onto my screen, uh, where we start off with identifying a weed and understanding the different tools for weed ID. This includes uh, dichotomous keys, different weed identification manuals, but even things like understanding how to manage a weed in the field, uh, when to use a hand rake, when to use a shovel, when you need a root wrench. So introducing these different tools that exist to individuals and making sure everyone knows how to uh, safely and properly remove a weed in the field. Something else that we think is critically important is having a basic understanding of phenology, the timing of plants um, on an annual basis. Uh, a great example of this is with dandelion, where it has this beautiful flower, but we all fear that wretched seed head. So, under, so making sure that everyone we work with understands that you want to try and remove the dandelion before it reaches its seed head, that way those seeds can't spread throughout the field. And that's just one example of how phenology can be uh, applied to land care, and there's hundreds if not thousands of applications of how a, a basic knowledge of phenology can go such a long way. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, inspections and reporting, something that's maybe not the sexiest part of the presentation, but something that I think is critically important. So first and foremost, the most important part of this is, uh, is that when you conduct an inspection, it helps to ensure that you are do it, that you're taking the proper uh, steps to make sure that the stormwater BMP that you're working with, the green infrastructure unit that you're working with this, is going to have continued functionality, that you're checking every nook and cranny to make sure that this will still continue to function. Uh, so this is the worksheet that we use for Minneapolis public schools. It kind of serves as a basic reminder to make sure that we're checking all the boxes quite literally in this instance. Um, something else that we think is critically important here is that this is our medium for communication, where you could be the absolute best green infrastructure, uh, green infrastructure expert in the world, but if you're not able to communicate that with the vendor who's contracting you for this work, then, uh, then it doesn't really hold as much water. So we wanna make sure that all the apprentices that we work with here have a thorough understanding of the value of communication and that they see inspections as reporting as a tool of communicating with your vendor, with uh, the individual, the entity that's hired you, so that you can successfully show that this is what we've done, this is how we are uh, demonstrating our value to you. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, and I guess that uh, that covers it for, for me. <laughs> yep. That was it. Yeah, so the Blue Thumb Sustainable Land Care Academy, we just launched it. Oh, sorry, I, yeah. Uh, we just launched it this year, and the next step that we're trying to take is not only 
uh, providing this job skills training to the apprentices we're working with, but also trying to connect them to career and uh, career and academic opportunities. So we definitely look at everyone in the audience today as a possible um, attendee or user of this program, but also as a potential employer for the individuals that we train. Okay, I hope I didn't go too long. I wasn't watching the time to be honest, but that's all I've got. Hopefully we have some time for Q&A. You're right on time. Thank you, James. Um, and I, so if any of you have questions, feel free to raise your hands or um, enter them into the chat box as well. I guess I have one question, James. Um, mm -hmm. Where does Metro Blooms and or Blue Thumb work across the state? Um, and are there resources or tools that might be useful um, in greater Minnesota? That is a very good question. So Metro Blooms is uh, based in Minneapolis. We do our work in the greater Twin Cities area, but Blue Thumb is a statewide uh, partnership. We're even starting to expand to uh, more of a regional partnership in the upper Midwest, North Central. I'm from New York. I'm not sure what the proper term for this region is. I hear both upper Midwest and North Central, but uh, Blue Thumb, and this is a Blue Thumb program. So we are trying to make this something that can be accessible to partners um, all over the state. So in addition to the field training, uh, this training is structured as there's a 10 hour online curriculum, which many of the partners here today uh, help, helped us create, followed by a six hour in field session. So the, the hope is that the, um, the online curriculum could, could increase accessibility. And, uh, and then it's just a one day drive out that we do for the in field training. Great, that's awesome to hear. Um, it sounds like a great program and an opportunity for um, youth across the state to to really get in on some of this great work. Sean, I see a comment here from you. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Oh yeah, I just wanted to share the opportunity that um, all the counties in Minnesota have workforce development boards, and there's a workforce development coordination whatever state committee so if the federal infrastructure dollars are coming through to fix pipes and you know weatherize and you know green infrastructure all that uh, it looks like maybe there would be ways of getting some more serious partnerships between the watershed districts and the counties and the cities related to um, workforce development pathways so I just put that into the chat box. It's part of the new Hennepin County Climate Action Plan. And so um, they, they have a new climate resiliency department that's trying to like team up between all the different departments. So I'm not sure if anybody has any ideas of who might kind of kind of head up how to take advantage of the um, workforce development infrastructure with counties and some of the federal, you know, new federal money to make some more of this happen. It's happening a lot with solar, you know, job training centers, but I haven't heard about green infrastructure, like actual training centers or how to tie that into community colleges, et cetera. Sean, what did you say was the name of that new unit within Hennepin County? It's called the um, <clears throat> uh, Climate and Resiliency Department. And I can put into the chat box the two staff members, Deanna Salas Chamin and um, Brian Shackleton are the two current staff members so far. Yeah, if you could throw their names into the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, great, yep. Well, thank you, James. Um, I will share slides with all of you um, again. So you have that information and you can follow up with James with any other questions that might come um, up later this morning or later. So we'll go ahead and move on um, to hear from Anna, who <laughs> looks distracted, so I'm <laughs> reluctant to call on you. But um, um, Anna is with the Capital Region Watershed District and uh, is going to talk a little bit more about some specific projects that they're doing and um, how maintenance happens um, with their partners. So Anna, are you going to share your screen? Perfect. 
and there we go. Hi, good morning. Sorry about that little bit of a distraction. I have my dog coming into the house, so I was worried that she was going to start barking. So um, with that, uh, well, first off, um, thank you very much to the MPCA for inviting Capital Region Watershed District to talk about maintenance of rain gardens and other bioretention practices. Again, my name is Anna Liria. I'm a planning projects and grant division manager at Capital Region. I've been with the organization for 13 years. Um, Capital Region Watershed District is located right in the heart of the Twin Cities area. Um, we have uh, 40 square miles within our boundaries and five cities that comprise our watershed district. Nope, Anna, sorry, it looks like you just muted yourself. Sorry about that, wrong screen. I've got two screens here. There's my next slide. Um, so 80% um, of the city of St. Paul is located within Capital Region Watershed District. We have portions of the city of Lauderdale, portion of Roseville, Maplewood, and all of Falcon Heights within our watershed. We've been around for over 20 years now, um, but since 2005, we have been supporting the planning, design, and construction of rain gardens and other clean water projects. In total, um, we've got nearly 800 rain gardens throughout the watershed district. Um, you know, how um, these rain gardens came about, um, really through three avenues at the watershed organization where we take a multifaceted approach to um, um, capturing and cleaning stormwater runoff. The first route is through our grant program um, that began in 2005. Um, of those 800 rain gardens, 50% of them have um, been funded uh, through our grant program. So these are voluntary rain gardens that take place um, at single family residential properties, um, businesses, institutions uh, within uh, street uh, within city streets, uh, boulevards, um, and other locations. Uh, the balance, um, and then the other 50% um, of it is comprised of uh, rain gardens that come about through our partnership with the city of St. Paul. The city of St. Paul has a street reconstruction program, and since uh, the late 2000s, they have been, as part of that street reconstruction program, identified suitable boulevards for installing rain gardens. So, um, you know, I think we've participated in over half a dozen street reconstruction projects in the city of St. Paul, and we've been able to build um, over 250 rain gardens through that partnership with the city. And then the remaining rain gardens at about 14% have come through our CRWD permitting program. Um, you know, we regulate projects uh, that disturb over an acre of land and um, some of those permittees build rain gardens to meet CRWD stormwater rules. Um, and I always just like to highlight the benefits from a water quality standpoint of these projects. Um, you know, on an annual basis, we are capturing over 10 million cubic feet of water uh, and cleansing it. And in many cases, putting it back into the ground, we are reducing sediment loading by 52,000 pounds a year and then reducing phosphorus by 240 pounds. So these just these few slides just give you a sense of the breadth of uh, Capital Region Watershed Districts, um, you know, involvement and um, support of rain gardens. So as I mentioned, half of our rain garden projects um, uh, come from our stewardship grant program. We also lump the uh, rain gardens that are built in the boulevard with the city of St. Paul under our stewardship grant program. So that's about 75% of the rain gardens fall under the stewardship grant program. And while we help to plan and design it, we remain involved post-construction in the inspection and maintenance of these rain gardens. Just a bit of play in my slides. So, um, you know, with our stewardship grant program, which is a cost share grant program, um, we require the homeowners 
or the property owners to um, agree to maintain their rain gardens for 10 years. Um, and as part of that maintenance requirement, we do offer a lot of education, um, outreach and technical technical support to the property owners. Um, and we also inspect their rain gardens on an annual basis for the first five years so that we can help to ensure that um, these investments that are made, um, you know, um, get established and are functioning properly uh, during those first five years. So um, what you're seeing here is just um, an image of our the first page of our gardening guide. These are, you know, we try to keep this as simple as possible for the property owners. You know, six questions, you know, about uh, maintaining, caring for your rain garden, you know, making sure that, um, you know, water is not ponded more than 48 hours. Is your rain garden draining? Um, is there anything blocking the flow of water to your inlet? Um, you know, that uh, prevents water from getting into the rain, rain garden, seeping into the ground. Um, are there dirt, leaves, trash, or other debris that is impacting, um, you know, um, you know, the infiltration water into the basin? Also, are, is there any erosion or bare soil in the in the garden that um, can impact its functionality? Um, you know, this was a question that we we're you know all having to uh, consider this past summer. Do your plants need more water? Supplemental water required for your rain garden? And um, you know, um, this is one of the biggest challenges to maintaining the rain garden: are weeds present? So we provide them this guide. Um, and if um, if there are yes to any of these questions, we offer them um, a number of suggested tasks to take care of it. Um, we also split up, um, um, you know, their garden care by season, asking uh, property owners to, you know, um, think about maintaining it in seasons in the spring. You know, it's about prepping and getting ready uh, for the growth of your rain garden and making sure you can get water in the garden. Um, it's a good time to to weed as well. We recommend so it doesn't seem so daunting to weed three times a year at minimum at the holidays, Memorial Day, July 4th and Labor Day, somewhere around those times. Um, you know, it can also be an opportunity to um, add plants, move plants, divide plants in the springtime. Summer moves into uh, maintenance, just making sure water gets into the garden again, um, doing some weeding, fall, also similar tasks. Uh, we recommend folks keep um, their native plants in the garden through the winter. Um, so it provides food and cover for wildlife. And then just in the winter time, just um, making sure there's no trash and debris in those gardens and minimize piling of snow in the gardens. Because what we are finding is, um, especially if you've got a boulevard rain garden um, and salt is applied to your streets, that is impacting uh, the health of, of your plants. Um, and then as part of our rain garden guide, we also provide some suggested plants. Um, as replacements, but we all highly suggest people look back at their original plan, um, see there and see if they can uh, use um, replace plants that have gone missing with those. And if not, here's some other plants to consider and different sources um, for more information about these, these native perennials um, and where to source them. So I'm going to shift a little bit. So that's the information we give um, to to our grantees up front that are responsible for uh, operation and maintenance of their gardens, um, and we expect that they, you know, are um, inspecting them on a regular basis. The district does inspect these sites, as I mentioned. Um, you know, once a year in the summertime, generally in July, um, and for the first five years of each of these projects. Uh, this past summer, we conducted nearly 350 inspections um, of our stewardship grant projects, and we do fund a number of different clean water projects, not just rain gardens or other bioretention practices, but still a majority of them are bioretention. And we are pleased to see, and this has been the case, 
for the past five years is that many of them, over 80%, are in good condition. And how we define good condition for the watershed district is those those six questions, you know, I had mentioned earlier, you know, um, is the water getting into the rain garden? Um, is there lack of ponding of water? Um, is it free of weeds? Is the inlet clear of uh, trash and debris and sediment um, and also the basin? And um, so we're pleased to report that and many of the maintenance requirements are met. Some of the things that are most common that we're seeing though with these projects that folks um, need to work on are keeping the inlet clear, weeding and replacing plants. Um, there is a couple things to or caveats about um, our inspections and the reporting we provide. We actually provide postcards uh, with this information to the homeowners and suggested next steps for maintenance. Um, a couple of things though that um, is not really identified through our inspections and you can see here a couple photographs of older rain gardens that we've funded that um, you know we we make note of it but doesn't get into the um oh into the grading or you know the um scoring of a good um average or poor condition rain garden but if if it's getting overgrown you know um or you know are the plants getting too tall? Are they exceeding plant height? Um, um, in the city of St. Paul, uh, in the boulevard, there are ordinance on plant height. Is the plants encroaching beyond the curb line and into the sidewalk? Um, we are seeing as the plants get older, we're losing uh, species diversity um, and certain types, both of native plants that were originally part of the design, as well as undesirables and non-natives have taken over our rain gardens. One of the original plants we put in our boulevard rain gardens is switchgrass. We have found that uh, switchgrass is, um, it, it's a spreading grass. It can overtake the garden and outcompete other natives. Um, and they are very difficult to remove for the typical homeowner. So we're now no longer including that in our planting plants. And then just, you know, um, and in some folks' mind, this is subjective. Um, these start to look unattractive and affects the aesthetics of uh, these these BMPs. Um, you know, and some of the reasons for the these maintenance issues, we're finding lack of knowledge uh, for of the grantees and maintenance and guarding. Um, some of our original BMP designs or planting plan are too complex are not suitable for the type of property owner and their knowledge and capacity to do the work. Um, in other cases too, the original grantee, the one who volunteered to implement these clean water projects is no longer involved. So those are some of the issues. So we have um, made, we're continuing to try to improve our um, maintenance program for grant funded projects. Um, those include adapting our rain garden designs, um, you know, still focusing on natives or native cultivars, maybe reducing the number of plant species in there, thinking about their form a little bit more in the rain garden and the plant height. Um, so there's some simplification, but we also are looking at a new approach to rain garden designs or new approach to us, and that's design plant communities. So where you actually um, actually put a lot of plants into a rain garden and put a green living mulch and create these layers in the rain gardens. Uh, we're testing out that type of design with certain grant funded projects. If that grantee has interest in willingness and capacity to do a little bit more maintenance up front, um, we um, have a maintenance web page. Um, we really think it's important not only during the construction of these pro planning and construction of these projects to inform them about the maintenance requirements, but we we're trying more to be in touch with them after project completion. We provide seasonal maintenance tips, new e newsletters. Um, we offer an annual rain garden maintenance workshop, and if a grantee needs 
um, more assistance and prefers a one on one maintenance site visits. We've partnered with our Minnesota water stewards and master gardeners to help um, you know, provide site visits. And finally, this is a new offering for the district is we are going to be offering maintenance grants. Um, to previously funded projects. So up to $2,000 for 50% of the maintenance cost to try to reduce the financial barrier to maintenance and recognize some of this, it does require work by contractors for some of these projects. Um, let's see, and quickly, I just want to wrap up, shift a little bit. So this is some of the things we've been doing uh, for stewardship grant projects for maintenance, um, shifting really quickly here to now um, the green line, green infrastructure practices that include rain gardens and stormwater planters along university. There's 14 rain gardens and stormwater planters along this line. They were built in 2012. We're kind of using this, uh, this project as a living laboratory to uh, really um, understand what it takes to uh, manage uh, these practices in a really busy urban commercial corridor that has, I think, more pressures on it than some of the other rain gardens that are located in residential areas. Um, let's see. The biggest concern we're seeing in these practices are trash and sediment. Um, we maintain uh, these practices through a contractor. Um, they conduct inspections and maintenance bi-weekly, so twice a month on average between April and October. And we, we tried to go back to once a month or scale it back once a month, but have found because of trash and sediment, we need to go twice a month. Um, and uh, remove remove trash, and you can see it runs the gamut of the type type of trash you see in these these practices. One thing we say, even though it's a lot of work, it's better here, <laughs> you know, in these practices than eventually in the river. Um, that picture on the right for me was really disturbing to see a few years ago, seeing that actually people are using it to dispose of their household waste, and this was early in the spring. Um, you know, but it, it really spoke to me about the importance of maintaining it and making sure that folks, you know, that their signage and folks don't see this as um, a large trash can, you know, so um, replacing plants as needed, getting mulch in there and going out early in the season to maintain um, gardens. The other important thing we're finding with our practices is uh, pretreatment, extremely important to um, select, design, size the inlets, uh, pretreatment structures for our rain gardens. We use curb cuts in many of these because we want to make it obvious to uh, the, um, the residents, the neighbors, the passerbys that this is a um, clean water feature uh, that cleanses stormwater. Um, but as you can see, there's just so much sediment within this corridor. So, um, you know, um, selecting the right material for the inlet is really important. That top left corner, we use Casota stone. It's too soft of a material. You need something much more durable. It's beautiful. It matched the other furnishings with our rain garden, but we've now switched it to concrete and a poor concrete step. Um, and you need to size it correctly. The bottom right photo, um, that <laughs> inlet was way too small for the drainage area. So making sure it's sized correctly is important. Um, and then this is just a slide, you know, how we've modified our pretreatment structures, which is primarily to make them larger um, and replace the material. Um, I just, as far as the original planting palette, we didn't go with a lot of different trees. I, I mean, trees, grasses, and uh, Forbes in our rain gardens, we kept it pretty limited uh, for maintenance purposes, as well as, you know, being really intentional what what we think could survive. Um, you know, and what we found is um, not all of them survived very well. The table here on the left shows what we have found as successful plants. Uh, Carl Forrester Feather Reed 
grass, heavy metal switchgrass, the walkers, low cat mint, and Kentucky coffee trees. Um, the plants in the middle of that table have not done well, uh, which is unfortunate. Much of them are, are the forbs there. Um, we were hoping to add um, at least a little bit more color to these practices, but they just have not succeeded. So we are moving mostly to sedges and grasses um, with those trees. Um, and we're finding it's likely due to sediment and chloride. We've done tree replacements, I should say now, I mean, not tree, plant replacements four times. We've also done it this year, um, you know, and just trying to figure out the, the best uh, mix um you know in our rain gardens oops um and then just sort of a series of photos of one of the sites that shows how it has evolved um and the the challenges <laughs> we're facing there again it's collecting a lot of sediment but it's filling the basin and um i think bringing with it um pollutants and chlorides and just killing the plants over time in the Greg stormwater planter. Uh, this starting from 2014, these were built in 2012 and then all the way to 2021. And you can see um, we've had to do a number of plant replacements, um, including this past summer um, in expansion of the inlet there. It's a test site. Um, on average, I'm wrapping up here, we're spending um, about $18,000 a year on both routine and non-routine maintenance work of these 14 BMPs. So that average is uh, a little over $1,000 per practice on an annual basis for contractor work. Um, and then, you know, overall, we find that these practices are excess success they're uh, cleaning stormwater runoff. They're removing trash, debris, and sediment uh, from stormwater runoff. They're soaking, um, picking up phosphorus as well. Um, you know, these O&M costs are a little bit lower than was originally estimated by our engineer. Um, and, you know, these are extremely challenging environments for plants to grow, but, um, you know, um, we, we are um, finding the trees are doing well and are looking to find the right plant and sedge mix in the gardens. Um, so with that, I know my time is up here. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't leave enough time for questions. Kristen, is there any more time? Yeah, yeah we, definitely we definitely have a couple, have a couple minutes, minutes if anyone, anyone wants to ask any other questions. It looks like you set some good reminders um, for Stephanie and myself that we need to go out and clean our our garden beds um, <laughs> as the fall's coming in here. Um, and then Sean asked, uh, the Green Line Gardens and tree boxes are great examples. Um, what combination of funding enabled those BMPs? And then um, a little bit, if you could speak more to the salt pollution um, impacts to, to, the, to those um, projects. Sure, yeah, okay, great questions, um, Sean. So the projects were funded by a combination of watershed district funding, and we receive our funding through tax levy. Um, it was also funded by Clean Water Fund grants back in 2012. Um, we received a pretty sizable grant for, for uh, these BMPs, I think, because um, you know, it was an opportunity. We actually constructed these as part of the construction of the green line, um, we were able to piggyback um, that construction activity with our own work. So disturbance was, um, you know, focused during that time period. We didn't go, come in afterwards. Um, as far as, um, you know, chloride pollution on these rain gardens, um, you know, I want to say it's both. Chloride pollution and um, the temperature of the stormwater runoff, I think I failed to mention that in my presentation as really impacting uh, uh, plants, plant health there. You know, salts are, um, you know, especially in these busy transportation corridors where um, probably applied more frequently than in other areas has to, um, be, you know, taken into consideration. We are finding the switchgrass, which may not work in a residential rain garden, which I mentioned earlier, because, but in these deeper gardens, um, 
though those are working and so is the walker campment we're finding and the trees are doing fine um yeah I, I don't know if anyone else i mean i know we've got other urban watershed organizations here but if there are any others you know i'd love to have an you know future discussion on you know what plants work well uh in those environments i've Couple. had a lot of oh sorry go ahead sorry <laughs> so specifically in those areas i've had a lot of success with um butterfly weed and prairie smoke some others as well, but those are kind of two stars that I would highlight. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, James. A uh, couple other for you, Anna. If you could go back to the slide that you showed um, the successful plants and those that failed. Yeah, so I think um, Barb had just a, a clarifying question of the replacement plants on that third column, which it looks like fox sedge failed. Does that mean that the that false indigo, big blue stem, and switchgrass were successful? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah, for not adding that to the slide. I will say fox sedge has not worked well for us. Not just here at the Green Line, but we also built some boulevard rain gardens um, north of there in a more residential neighborhood in the Lake McCarran subwatershed, and we also. Um, had trouble with fox sedge, so moving away from the that plant species. And then uh, James had one too for you. So for the construction detail on the boulevard plantings, are they flat or concave or some other configuration and what depth are they? Sure, sure. It, it varies for the boulevard plantings. James, I think you're referring to the rain gardens, not the stormwater planters, correct? Okay. Yeah, for um, the rain gardens, the depth ranges from six to nine inches, and uh, we have three to one side slopes for those. Um, that is a requirement um, from the city of St. Paul. So we, um, you know, does that answer your question, James? You're, what are you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. When 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 we've tried them, I feel like we just don't have enough space to to reach that kind of three to one side slopes reaching that depth. But I guess it all it varies so much from boulevard to boulevard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Um, we so when we don't have the space to put in the three to one side slopes. Um, and I should say in the city of St. Paul, we're also required on the um, to provide a two foot flat buffer, um, you know, to allow if there's parking folks to step off onto a flat area. So um, when we can't do that, we do look to those stormwater planters that I had mentioned to earlier where we can put um, vertical sidewalls go deeper up to a foot, but it does require railing. So those types of be the stormwater planters are a little bit more expensive uh, because it requires that, um, you know, concrete sidewalls and the railing. Well, thank you, Anna, um, for sharing uh, some of what Capital Region Watershed District is doing. And that was um, really helpful information. I really, I already pulled up the, the um, homeowner guide that you shared at the beginning of the presentation. I really like that, so thank you. We are going to jump in here um, with Doug Snyder. Um, so here from another watershed district, um, but this time Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. And I'm sorry, you're not a district, you're an organization. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it looks like you are sharing. Yeah, and I'm not sorry that we're not a district, but it is um, one of those things where we do have slightly different authorities, and so there are distinctions that are important. But uh, for purpose of this, uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Doug Snyder. I'm the executive director at the Mississippi Watershed. I've uh, been here about 20 years now. The uh, watershed was uh, formed about the same time. And I just to give you a bit of context, we are immediately adjacent west of uh, Cap Region. We have very similar watersheds in the sense that we're fully developed. Um, our watershed on the left side here is um, just kind of a uh, topo map where we have a few high points 
but everything is sloped toward the river and our entire watershed is a piped watershed. We don't have overland flow of water to, to the river. It's all through pipes. Um, the map on the right is uh, the purple areas are commercial industrial and the yellow areas are residential. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's highly developed and um, there's really not a lot of open space um, we've done some studies to try to find out where we can do green infrastructure in a meaningful way. And we're kind of looking at green infrastructure at the moment as being uh, done as uh, a restorative um, effort as part of land development and transportation development. So we spent a good deal of our time early on with folks to get into their planning processes for their uh, road reconstruction or development. Uh, to try to find sites uh, where we can do green infrastructure improvements. The map on the left is just looking at areas where we have constrict uh, issues with either soils or pollutants or whatever uh, that wouldn't allow infiltration to occur for us in all likelihood. And the one on the right is looking at uh, the number of industrial stormwater permits and where the discharges into the river occur. Um, all these things can limit the kind of work that we can do here. Um, that said, um, we have taken on a number of projects. So I'm just going to kind of step through a few of the projects that we've done uh, in the last few years. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll give you our website. We have a, a high number of other projects that you could look through in, the, in those projects contains some cost information and um, also what we're looking at for pollutant removals and whatnot. But on uh, most of these projects, we're participating <clears throat> in part because we want to monitor and follow um, the maintenance for the first three to five years on these to see just how effective they are over time. Uh, this is H Street planters. Um, this is what the street looked like initially. Um, this is reworking that street. We're working on both sides of the street here. At various points during construction, we were out um, making sure that the infiltration was actually going to occur. Um, I know that uh, anybody who's worked with construction crews on these kinds of projects, you have to be aware that not all of those crews understand the, these systems, and you have to be out there to ensure that if you want infiltration, you're going to get infiltration. Um, sometimes that's through construction practice mistakes, and sometimes it's just you run into soils or something you didn't expect to run into, and then you have to be there to help figure out how you're going to solve that problem. So <clears throat> as these were finished up and planted out, um, we've installed monitoring equipment in these so we can track infiltration rates on them. Um, since they are downtown, uh, we've been working with the downtown improvement district um, on other street trees down there and trying to find out what has been impacting uh, the growth of those trees. So and most particularly uh, chloride salt um, are a big issue in these systems. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we can monitor those. The other issue that we have here is also with um, trash. Um, cigarette butts are an incredibly big issue for us. Uh, not only do we find them here, but we've got photos of mass of them in the river from just flushing down through the system. Um, and, you know, while it's Again, we would we have to be out there fairly frequently for these and for the growth solids as well to try to keep them pulled out of these systems. And I would uh, say the other one that's problematic is snow removal or snow placement in these systems. And uh, as you can see, the at least sidewalk that kind of whitish color that's that's salt. Um, and so this is just an ongoing um, issue that. Um, over the next few years, we're hoping that we can collect enough data to understand how we might mitigate that. We're, we're playing with the idea of 
flushing the systems in the spring, um, if, if possible, just running down that salt through the soil a little bit so that the tree roots are not impacted by it um, early on. Uh, we're working with, again, Downtown Improvement District on that and also uh, Dave Tree. Uh, um, they've helped supply some of the monitoring equipment um, to see if we can figure out ways to make that functional. Um, this is a, a residential application of tree trench and higher heights. Um, one of the things that was clear in, in this particular project was the need to uh, meet with the homeowners. These, these systems are not their typical grassed boulevard system. And so there, there's some um, uncertainty from the homeowners of whether they want something like this because they, they don't know how, and they're gonna be responsible for maintaining it. So they wanna be assured that it's, it's not gonna be more trouble than it used to be to get the mower out every other week and just mow the grass uh, kind of thing. Um, again, this is important because the uh, inlets on these things is, are really critical. It'll be interesting to see how these work. Um, this is something Minneapolis is trying for an inlet uh, on, in this particular case. Um, I, I think um, Cap Region has done some really important work on figuring out how to do the pretreatment and these inlet configurations for what works. Um, it doesn't require lots and lots of maintenance. Um, this is kind of the finished product on it, or the next one is. And um, we can already see with just a few events that these things are starting to fill up. So um, it, it is going to be the maintenance is going to be critical on that. How many times do we have to be out there? Is it one, you know, is it every other week? Is it once a month? Um, th that will be kind of what our role is, is working with those um, the homeowners city to try to figure out the best way to maintain these things. Um, for this particular application, we've developed uh, both a photo guide for their maintenance for the installed um, plants uh, and then also a weed guidance. Um, so just as Capital Region has done, um, and I think anybody who's put any number of these things in, the more you put in, the more you realize you have, this becomes a critical component uh, in order to ensure that long-term maintenance because typically the that maintenance falls to the um, property owner. Um, Uh, this was a retrofit of a uh, iron enhanced sand filter on a pond in uh, Columbia Heights. And um, the system works, this fills up, the pond will fill up, then it's pumped onto the uh, sand filter. And then there are three outlets here that we are monitoring uh, to see what kind of pollutant removal we get, particularly for phosphorus on this. Um, and then it's recycled through before it goes through the um, the outlet on that. This project um, maintenance on it, um, you can see over the course of the year, it becomes overgrown. Um, certainly not what we want <laughs> or what the city wants. Um, and so to, to get it back to this condition, um, we had a crew of approximately 15 to 20 individuals out there for one day annually to uh, do all the, re uh, the weed removal, uh, till that material back up again and, and get it ready for the next year. Um, so there is a, I mean, it's a fairly significant amount of time. It's one day, but it's, it's a lot of people. And because we don't uh, wanna use any uh, chemicals or anything with this, and it's all hand work and or mechanical work. Um, so you have to, I think you need to take that into account when you're doing any of these things is it really, it really is, you know, back to learning how, what's the proper tool to use and 
getting enough people out there in order that you know it becomes a party instead of a chore to get it cleaned up. Um, this is Edison High School. James mentioned it earlier for the one large basin that's just to the far side of it. So our project was in this section of the, one of our projects was in this section. That large flood area was over here. There's a parking lot we've done work on here. And there's also Monroe Street that we've done some, we'll step through some green infrastructure that's been put in place in those. Uh, all those sites across this. The idea is to make this a green campus. Uh, Michaela New here, who's worked with uh, Metro Blooms and numerous other folks to, uh, and uh, the Mississippi River Green team and Park Board to provide um, experience to youth, both from an education, but also a work experience. So this site, when we were developing it, we were trying to think of those things as well. Um, this is a, Infiltration area in the right again, a, a infiltration here with pervious pavers to as the inlet for that part of the system. Once again, this is being monitored both for our benefit, but also for uh, classes come out uh, from the school and, and learn how to monitor water resources in these settings. Um, that's the big old basin, which has since been redone, but just to give you an idea of the scale of a project like that, um, I, I don't have an after the fact picture, unfortunately, I didn't get out to get that. Um, on this project, um, what we did is we worked uh, to take water off the gymnasium rooftop, capture that, um, and then reuse it to water the football field which was redeveloped at the same time. Um, in addition to that, um, it was intended to be an educational piece as well. So this building gets used um, for concessions during football games, but it also houses a room for us for uh, UV equipment if we need it. Um, we currently, it's not operating with UV equipment and we seem to be having no trouble um, with uh, bacteria or anything getting out on the fields. There's also an educational on the left side of this. There's an educational area for uh, gardening and some other things that are used for it. Um, and on the inside of the building or uh, it, through the window, uh, we also have a screen set up that does real time monitoring that passes on data for what's being uh, captured off the gymnasium brought into the tanks and then so gymnasium into tanks and then back out onto the field. Um, this is, uh, you know, take trying to take advantage of an opportunity of where you have a lot of people at a football game or through the classroom or whatever. And again, just talking about what, what we're gaining by having these kind of systems put in place as part of the green infrastructure. Um, Later on, we had an opportunity because Monroe Street between the gymnasium and the school was being uh, reconstructed by the city um, as part of their safe street program. This is also where all the buses drop off and pick up. Is um, We worked with the city to do infiltration um, under the road. And this is the inlet above. Um, it's newly finished. I haven't really, um, don't know on data on how that's working at the moment. It's relatively, I think it was just done within this last year. Um, but again, we'll be tracking that. And again, early on, you can see that these area, these inlet areas are just a magnet for everything. So um, can't stress how important it is to understand what you, you know, what you're going to need to do to maintain these things is going to be largely around these, uh, the inlets to the systems, particularly along roads. Um, and we have found that out to be true. Um, the final project that I'd like to touch on is the um, Towerside. And Towerside was 
uh, a project in just east of the um, University of Minnesota football stadium. For those of you who know that area and um, the idea here was to work with four developers over eight acres and pre build all the stormwater infrastructure necessary for the development of those four sites. Um, there was a lot of interest from the developer point of view because um, we were essentially getting rid of their need to worry about stormwater. Um, we also, through the design process, were able to save because we could uh, get more treatment for less dollars by doing this district system. And then um, it took uh, almost two years to uh, craft the agreement that was necessary so that everybody understood what their ongoing roles and responsibilities and costs were going to be. And that really, to me, is probably the most important thing that came out of this entire project was setting up that structure where the city was comfortable with it, all four developers were comfortable with it, we were comfortable with it, the University of Minnesota had to be comfortable because we were tapping into their system as well. So while it took a long time to do, um, I think it's going to make the long term success of this uh, much more likely to happen. So the kind of the core of this system was to create a large um, structure where we could um, gather water and then reuse it across all four properties. And so um, there's a large tank over 200,000 gallons. Um, this is the top of the tank. So it actually collects water through here and then uh, gets down into the tank. Um, this is an early picture and while the development was still going on, the gardening area has since been improved and moved slightly. Um, it just gets a lot of use. It's become an amenity in that community. Um, the first time I saw this photo, I actually thought it was a fake photo. <laughs> um, but it, this is actually what happens. We, we get people down there um, really enjoying the space uh, in good times and also in the rain. Um, it's a different experience. So that fills up, drains down into the um, tank. This building over here contains um, pumps and UV. Uh, instrumentation or stuff here again is that building. Um, there's uh, Brett who had the unfortunate um, person to be on the phone calls when the alarms went off every day for about two weeks going for the filter and it turned out it was of course nothing to do with the filter but um, you know for this project the the kind of important part again for us is participating in the on the first five years of maintenance. Um, and so we've been working with the property owners, but we've been spearheading that maintenance um, and hiring the folks that need to be hired and helping show the property owners who that who those folks are, uh, how to work with them, the kind of question I said earlier, knowing enough to ask the right questions. Uh, knowing what to look for, uh, understanding how that UV system works, uh, and making sure that over time that this is going to continue to work. And of course, nothing ever does work perfectly. Um, so we've had we've been out the tank leaked, so we had to drain that down and plug it essentially. Um, and that seems to be functional now with no no problems in this last summer we actually had uh, enough water through the um, you know the no rain that we had to, to be able to water um, some of these street trees but also all that uh, gardens and park that's immediately adjacent to it so consider that to be a, a success there's a about a four block area of street that we uh, are trying to do as a habitat corridor. 
um, in addition to be a greening um, for stormwater. And um, here's Michaela with the, some green teamers out there doing some maintenance just a couple of weeks ago. Um, a large, they had a volunteer group and staff and green teamers were out there to work on this. It, it is um, certainly a big issue, even having uh, hiring consultants or hiring crews to come in and do this, you still need to make sure that they understand what they're supposed to be looking for and pulling and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, on our own site here, we had somebody come in and to uh, maintain our site for us and they inadvertently removed our uh, shag bark hickory because they hadn't seen it before and they didn't know what it was. Uh, and we had put it in because we're figuring with climate change, it may grow well up here now, but um, so it's it's those kinds of things in the on the maintenance side that um, kind of make you shake your head a little bit. Um, again, just more. Doug, I just wanted to check in with the time. Um, on my last slide. OK, perfect. Yep. And um, so anyway, the, the idea was that this was for uh, trying to do habitat, basically for uh, bees, butterflies, and birds. And um, fortunately, um, we seem to be at least successful in that part of the project so far. And then the last thing I, I would say is that we have numerous other projects that would kind of fit in the green category, the East Side Maintenance Facility. We've done work at the Sculpture Garden, Waterworks, Metro Transit Bus, all sorts of partners with all sorts of different types of green infrastructure. So anything from tanks and reuse to um, small uh, residential scale projects that are on our website. I would just say if um, you want to see some of those things, go to that. And if you have any other questions, you can certainly get a hold of me at that email address and I can connect you with uh, the right staff member here to answer your questions. And if you don't have any questions now. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, the only question I thought maybe you could, might be able to respond to in the chat so we can um, move on to Mark's presentation was how how do you how do you manage underground utilities or work around them um, in street and boulevard rain gardens and I actually yeah I had the same question myself like how do you I mean do that so um, maybe if you want to give well, it a quick uh, summary. Sure um, utilities are well. It's one reason why when we do any of these projects I spoke about a little bit earlier is that you have to get um, everybody that has a concern or manages an urban system at the table right away. So with Tower Side, because we had to cross the street underneath with some of our utilities, we had to work out an uh, easement agreement with Minneapolis and Minneapolis had never allowed it before. So it was kind of a first time thing for them and for us to figure out how to how to make that work. Oftentimes um, that the, the underground utility will become a restrictive factor and we just won't be able to do something where we thought we might be able to. Um, it may turn an infiltration project into a filtration with a under, underground drain. Um, I mean, it's, you just have to work with what you have and the space that you have. And I mean, that's been brought up before a couple times is very often you're just space limited, particularly when you're looking at uh, the linear systems. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, we'll go ahead and jump into our next presentation with Mark Maloney, um, Public Works Director of the City of Shoreview. So, Mark, I'm going to share slides for you. Let me. Um, while I'm pulling these up too, I wanted to mention that Sean shared the smart smart salting trainings um, that the Pollution Control Agency and partners host. And we've talked about salt a couple of times 
already. I'm sure Mark's probably going to say something about it too. Um, and so those are great opportunities for, uh, you know, city staff, but also business or um, winter maintenance uh, operators to uh, take those trainings. So find that link. All right, Mark, I think I am sharing. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, we've had um, a lot of, we've had a lot of experience and I would call it success with stormwater management BMP thinking here. But uh, today I'm just gonna focus on what we've been doing with permeable pavements. And I, the reason why I think that we've had the ability to be innovative and also be sustainable with these technologies is that we have a unified approach here at the city in terms of not just building this stuff, but taking care of it. I think James earlier in his presentation made reference to the fact that, um, and I'll use my words, that long after the awards and the ribbon cutting and, and everyone's enthusiasm about this stuff, becomes the cold reality that you have to maintain it and there has to be a commitment in the organization and um, I think we've had that here in Shoreview we're actually quite proud of that and so what's on the screen right now and this is a map of Shoreview I've for the purposes of this presentation I've clustered our permeable pavement installations in six areas these are all public installations on public roadways or public facilities there are other permeable pavement and other storm stormwater management um, infrastructure that was privately built but i'm going to focus today on what was public that we have uh, responsibility for and i think what probably jumps out at you when you look at this map is that there are a lot of water resources in shoreview it's sort of what we're known for and even in the upper uh, upper left hand corner of the map where you see a large circle uh, it's right adjacent to rice creek so even if so we've got creeks we've got lakes um and the proximity to these water bodies is usually driving our stormwater management philosophies. And so um, you can see that have all these areas broken up. Um, the lower right hand corner in the red circle is the previous concrete project that we did back in 2009. So we've been using some form of permeable pavement in our street reconstruction program um, for, for more than 12 years now. Um, and if you add it all up, it's about a mile and a half long of streets. And I'll revisit that later on in a slide to help you with some perspective. But that's how it breaks out in the city. You'll see that it's spread across the city and spread across a 12 year period. So going back to 2009, this was what we called our Woodbridge neighborhood. And this is where uh, we got a lot of both local and national coverage for building such, a, making such a large commit to, commitment to pervious concrete. This is what it looks like, fast forward 12 years later. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of aggregate loss in some of the areas. I'd like you to notice the context of the project. This was a fully developed residential area. This was not a, this was not a test strip or a demonstration out in the middle of nowhere. It was actually uh, someone's neighborhood. And so it was pretty bold. Um, and at the time, but uh, it was also it was also supported scientifically by um, what we were doing and the technology we were using. Um, the middle photograph shows you the signs that we have as we go into the neighborhood. This neighborhood is kind of isolated for a Shoreview neighborhood, so it's it is sort of a captive audience in a way. So it's a perfect place to try um, some different outreach techniques. And uh, we've followed up besides just the signs, the informational signs that we put in the neighborhood, which, you know, when I compare them to the signs that the watershed districts use and the WMOs used to call attention to their projects, ours look pretty city-like, but um, we'll work on that. But we've also had outreach with this neighborhood in terms of uh, direct mailings. And we actually had a, an open house picnic barbecue at this project um, when it was done to just get people there to engage them a little bit i don't i didn't include photos of that if we go to the next slide um, on the far left is what this pavement looks like 12 years later it looks pretty much the same as when it went down um, it's um, we've had again some aggregate loss in some areas but um, it's pretty intact we've actually done very little in terms of maintenance other than a very aggressive street sweeping. The picture second from the left 
shows you the realities of a permeable pavement in a suburban context. You'll see a lot of uh, leaf debris, acorns, pine needles, all that kind of stuff collecting in the gutters. Um, the third picture from the left is actually a portion of this roadway which is adjacent to a Ramsey County Highway. Um, we purposely do not use chlorides or de-icers in any of our permeable pavement areas. However, there's a run on to this road from a county highway facility, and you can see that the uh, pavement is degraded significantly from 12 years of intense chloride. And so, so much so that you can see a, a, some organic material sort of accumulating in one of the gullies. This is a part of the project where uh, for it will come back in a few years and replace about 50 feet of this roadway and uh, we'll be replacing it with um, a different type of permeable pavement system. But we're, um, it's been here for 12 years. We were estimating based on what the industry told us that this sort of approach could be a legitimate public uh, street infrastructure and we, we've experienced that. We've, um, we think this, even though it looks rough in the pictures on the right, um, that's not representative of the entire project area. We're quite satisfied with it. But again, it does require uh, rigorous street sweeping. So next. Uh, we were rebuilding our city maintenance facility as a lead gold facility in 2010. So it seemed natural that we would use some sort of permeable pavement option for our parking lot expansion. Here, here you'll see that with the same contractor and the same professionals involved, we ended up with a very different result. Um, one year later, after having a marvelous success with pervious concrete, the following year we ended up with something that was not as successful. And um, that we've done forensics, uh, it was maintained properly. The mix design was altered a little bit by the uh, concrete supplier, and we think that that's uh, representative of what you're looking at. So this is now 11 years into the life of that pavement and that pavement will be replaced with a different permeable pavement system probably within the next five years. So this is all pervious concrete that I've showed you so far. In 2014, we started, we, we moved to a different product, a product, and again, I'd be very careful about giving product endorsements, but this product is called Pave Drain. It's an interlocking block system. It's a permeable system. The, the blocks themselves are precast blocks, but when they're put together, you can see the gaps between the blocks, and that's how we get our stormwater management. And again, our rationale or our impetus for using any of this stuff in our street reconstruction projects was that we were attempting to solve stormwater management issues simultaneous with building roadways. And so that is what led us to this. Uh, I had done a significant amount of research on this particular product and was satisfied that it would meet the test of being real live public infrastructure. And so in this case, meeting a seven ton per axle loading um, design criteria. So this is what this project, this project was built in 2014. It's a relatively narrow residential street near Turtle Lake in Shoreview, and uh, it's held up quite well. You'll see in the center photograph uh, the realities of, you know, there's a cracked block in there. Uh, these blocks can be pulled out and replaced actually really quite easily if you feel like it's necessary. It's not really a structural issue here, um, so we're, it's the sort of thing we watch over time, and um, we'll go back and replace a block here or there when necessary. So next, continuing with that same product where the city built a water treatment plant in 2016 and because of the added impervious surface, the watershed required, uh, wa there were watershed requirements to manage stormwater in impervious surface. And so we ended up using a small amount of this in a parking area. And this pavement is now already five years old and you can see that it looks essentially exactly the same as the day it was laid. Um, it matters a lot what is draining onto a permeable pavement. In this particular case, uh, there's not a great deal of organic material that's finding its way to the pavement. And so this is just air swept on a regular basis, but um, it's been quite successful for us. So next. Uh, big project that was completed last year. Uh, this was a, a former county highway that was turned over to the city of Shoreview that went through a county park and you can see that there are lakes in the background. And so the city uh, took over the roadway and rebuilt it with 
uh, the largest installation of permeable pavement on a collector classified roadway in the state of Minnesota. And you can see the construction is occurring on the right. The, so the, you got before on the left, you got an aerial photograph during construction on the right. The county was rebuilding their parks and their park facilities simultaneous with the city rebuilding the roadway. And so the stormwater management components of all of this are interconnected. And so we had a, about a 700 lineal foot length of a collector roadway that was uh, built as a permeable pavement. And I think my next slide will show you some details of what that looks like up close. This is what it looked like uh, immediate, during and immediately after construction. You'll see again, it's the same paved drain material that's being used. Um, if there's I think it I, I just occurred to me that photo that's way on the right might be confusing to people. Why would there be a catch basin on a permeable roadway? The permeable roadway is designed to take, you know, a design store and up to 10 um, ten year uh, design recurrence. And um, we had to size the drainage and the overflow for bigger uh, events. Um, again, what you don't see under this pavement is a very large um, stormwater chamber and infiltration chamber. And so um, regardless, I just wanted to get you an idea of what this looks like in context. You can see that there's no gutter along the edges of the roadway. Primarily, it's just the paved drain goes right up against a vertical curbing. And there's not any rock material placed in the joints of the uh, material. It's just straight through. Next slide. So what happens to this stuff? Um, this is logical to wonder. You can see these are examples of pavements where we've had a fair amount of organic material accumulating and growing, frankly, in, in some of these cracks. This is not unusual. Um, it varies so much on the context of where it was installed and what's uh, what's draining onto the pavements, what's falling out of the pavements. But these are some before pictures. These are what these are some photos of what that material, that paved drain material, can look like. Even with rigorous air sweeping, you will get events. You will get deposition materials. Some of this stuff gets sticky and it doesn't come out with a vacuum sweeper. And so this, when it gets to this particular stage. Uh, you'll see in my next slides. Um, we actually pressure wash it and we bought it for $8,500. We bought a pressure washer and with two wands on it. And you can see kind of before and after photos of what happens um, after we pressure wash it and then lift the material up. Uh, the, the material that's come out of the cracks is lifted up and vacuumed away so we can restore, you know, 99% of the permeability of the block system with a pressure washer. And again, it, we, there have been some installations in the city where we have yet to go back and even do this. Some has have some uh, maybe need to be done every three to five years, depending on the land uses in the area. And so, yeah, I guess that's it. I didn't include a lot of facts and figures. I did want to. Um, kind of help you with the context. I had I'd mentioned earlier that all of these roadway sections that are permeable that require some sort of different maintenance protocols add up to about a mile and a half in my system. And that's um, that's like 1% of Shoreview street system. And so we had already committed to having air sweepers. Uh, we found out after we had been in the business of trying to maintain permeable pavement, we found out that owning a pressure washer made a lot of sense as opposed to hiring it out, but that is an option as well. Um, we sweep all the streets in the city, whether with a mechanical brush sweeper on our regular pavements or an air sweeper on our permeable pavements, all streets in the city of Shoreview are swept a minimum of six times a year. So street sweeping is a really, really important part of our maintenance protocols for for all of our street infrastructure, but uh, especially for our permeable infrastructure. So that's all I got. I kept it pretty low tech. I just wanted you to have some visceral images of this stuff as it goes in. And yes, it can be built and it can be installed and it can be maintained. But um, I think as it was pointed out in an earlier um, 
by an earlier speaker, there needs to be a commitment organizationally uh, to have these things be meaningful five or 10 years out in their lifespan, because these are public assets. And I, I don't think we're doing our job if we're just um, getting them built, but not really paying attention to them through their life cycle. So that's what I got. Thanks, Mark. This is really interesting. I feel like this is still like a new, new thing, new technology. But I mean, you you've shown that you've been doing this for years now, and um, it's really not so new and scary anymore. <laughs> I we did have one question from Greg. Um, you didn't touch on this. So how how is water freezing with um, pervious paving, either the concrete or the um, the tiles? Is, is that a concern with our freeze thaw cycles in, in Minnesota? That's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I have a I have hours of material that I would love to share with anyone. So please, again, my name is Mark Maloney. I'm at the city of Shoreview. But to answer your question, um, what you didn't see in my photographs was what was under the pavement. And what's under the pavement, whether it was pervious concrete or whether it was the concrete block system, is two to three feet of very large angular, um, almost railroad ballast type drainage layer material. And so the whole point of a permeable pavement in a cold weather region like Minnesota is that the water doesn't stay in the pavement. It gets through the pavement and goes down into the rock layer. And so um, we haven't had any instances of spalling or um, freeze thaw damage on our permeable pavements because if they're properly designed and properly maintained, the water doesn't stay up in the pavement structure. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that we do not, um, we do not use salt. We have no, no de-icer application on any of these permeable pavements that I've shown you. And it's for two reasons. Um, one, you know, there's an aversion to getting a lot of chlorides in a concrete environment. But more importantly, we're very aware of uh, chloride issues in the Twin Cities area. And so um, we were really testing the, the premise that some of these pavements, these pavements by their very nature are sort of self-cleaning. Uh, when if there's a small amount of ice buildup on a permeable pavement and you get a sunny day, it melts enough to go down through the pavement. And so, um, Apologies to those who've heard this before, but our, our joke in Shoreview is that these pavements provide, in, in the winter, these permeable pavements perform just as poorly as regular pavements, um, depending on whether they're shaded or, you know, what uh, the weather's been doing. But we've had no complaints in any of these permeable pavement areas due to uh, winter conditions any differently than uh, our normal streets. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our um, speakers today. I will be sharing um, slides and the recording with you all just really quick. I know we're at time. Um, here is a slide with some of the storm water green infrastructure related best practice actions that you'll find in the Green Step Cities program. Um, so many of you are doing these things already. Uh, don't forget to include those as actions. And then finally, next up, um, we have some more workshops coming up. Uh, equitable community engagement is next on the 22nd of this month um, and then more throughout the year. So that with that, um, thank you again to everyone for joining um, and to our speakers and um, feel free to follow up with questions um, as well. And yeah, this was great. Thank you, everyone.